Welcome to Glenda Blasts Your Ear Off, flash fiction stories written by Josh Bush and narrated by Glenda Villamar. Enjoy! You have 1,440 minutes in a day. Use five of those minutes and visit freerice.com to play trivia games and help end world hunger. Freerice.com In this episode, Ritza joins her uncle in space. Ritza unbuckled the shoulder and leg harnesses that had kept her secured in her seat for liftoff. Ritza tried to move through the air in the zero gravity of the spaceship as if she were in water with a swimming stroke. But with there being no friction as there is in water, there was nothing to push off against, and she was unable to make herself go forward. Her uncle said to her, You'll get used to it. Try your jet. Ritza looked down at the strap that wrapped around her left bicep. There was a button there which she pressed with her right hand, and it activated the tiny propulsion jet that was wrapped around her left wrist. Ritza gently flew back in the opposite direction of where she pointed the jet's nozzle, which resulted in her being roughly pushed deeper into her seat. Unflummoxed, Ritza then pointed the jet behind her head, and she promptly floated into the hallway and was slapped in the face by a large palm tree leaf. Ritza rubbed her face and asked the leaf, "'What did I ever do to you?' The hallway's walls and ceiling were almost completely blanketed with plants, trees, long grasses, bushes, and vines, and with no gravity, the leaves floated and bobbed in nonsensical directions. There was so much greenery, Ritza could barely see the walls, and if she didn't look down, she felt like she was in a claustrophobic jungle. Ritza told her uncle Renwick, I feel like I'm in a dream. Flying in my spaceship sure is a dream, all right, said Captain Uberta who had just drifted up to them. Uberta, like the rest of them, only wore what resembled a swimsuit, because it was always 95 degrees on the ship because of the heat that poured off the engines. And so Ritza could see all of the tattoos the captain sported, neon orange tattoos that glowed brightly and seemed to dance over her dark black skin. The captain noticed Ritza's attention, and she said, Like my tattoos, do you, Skinny? I'll give you a closer look. And Uberta drifted over to Ritza, and she didn't stop until her face was inches from Ritza's face. Ritza didn't like being this close at all. Ritza asked, Skinny? Is that my new nickname or something? Uberta answered, Doesn't it just fit you? I didn't even know people came as skinny as you. And that head, it's so tiny! And Uberta put her hand against the side of Ritza's head. Ritza tried very hard not to show how uncomfortable this was making her. A man entered the hallway and said, Let's just hope there's room in that small head for common sense. Aberta looked at the newcomer and said, Now, now, Verrier, let's be nice. I'm sure she's got some common sense in there. Uncle Renwick said indignantly, I assure you my niece has common sense. As much as Ritza liked being stuck up for, she wondered just how did her uncle know that. After all, it had been 20 years since she last saw him and she'd been a small child, so small that she didn't even remember his visit. Aberta looked back to Ritza and said, Now, Skinny, look at my favorite tattoo, my pride and joy. Ritza looked where the captain pointed, at her flat mahogany stomach, where a giant dragon was wrapped around a castle, and it breathed fire into the sky. The vibrantly orange dragon pulsed like a strobe light, and its fire undulated like a river with waves of red, orange, and blue. Ritza told her, It's beautiful. Stunning. And the captain smiled approvingly. Verrier chuckled and said, You're going to see things here in space that pale in comparison to mere tattoos. Ritza quickly glanced at the rest of Uberta's tattoos and saw they were all dragons. Uberta jetted back out of Ritza's personal space, turned to Renwick, and she said, Talking about things we're going to see in space, where are we going, Renwick? Are you going to find us a nice bit of treasure? Verrier asked, And how is it you're even able to find these riches? What's your secret, old man? Ritza was curious about that herself. There wasn't much she did know about her uncle. She knew he was the older brother to her dead mother, but for all intents and purposes, he was a stranger, one who had popped up out of nowhere, asking her if she wanted to hunt for treasure with him in the outskirts of the solar system. Renwick chuckled and said, If I told you how, I wouldn't be much use to you, would I? You'd have no incentive to keep me around. Verrier spat. 
One day I'm going to make you tell, and I don't think you're going to like how I go about getting you to talk. Ritza began to worry about Verrier. Aberta said, Let him keep his secrets. As long as he keeps finding us treasure, that is. Now Renwick. And her playful tone changed, and Ritza thought the captain sounded quite menacing. You've had us go halfway around the solar system to fetch your niece here. Now you do have the coordinates of some treasure for us, don't you? You know how I can get when I'm disappointed. Ritza could see fear on her uncle's face. Was her uncle afraid of the captain? Who were these two to her uncle? What kind of situation was he in here? And now her. Her uncle had a lot of explaining to do. Renwick feigned nonchalance and told her, Oh yes, I know exactly where to go. Don't you worry. This score will make us all comfortable for a while. Well, good. I do like being comfortable. Now off you go. Run along and tell the pilot the coordinates. And with trepidation, Ritza watched Renwick slink away, leaving Ritza with these two criminals? Is that what they were? Aberta asked Ritza, Tell me what you know about these treasures, their history. What do you know about how they got there? Ritza answered, I don't know much, only what everyone else already knows. Aberta said, Tell me what everybody else knows, then. I want to see what you know. Verrier chimed in with, This ought to be good. And Ritza noticed that he had gotten closer. Ritza, in this jungle in a tube of a spaceship, felt like these two were jungle cats, closing in for the kill. Trying to ignore Verrier and her increasing anxiety, Ritza said, Um, uh, sure. About 30 or 40 years ago, no one knows for certain, two different advanced alien species fought one another with their competing fleets of spaceships by our solar system's gas giants. The aliens left, presumably to fight elsewhere, leaving the wrecked ships that are filled with technology that none of our scientists could have ever dreamed up. People have found the ships orbiting our gas giants, their moons, and neighboring asteroids. Aberta nodded her head and said, Yep, that's what everyone knows, all right, Verrier asked. And Skinny, I do like that nickname. What happens to the people who find these alien derelicts that are filled with treasure? Ever since Ritza was a small child, she had dreamed of finding an alien ship that no one had ever found before, to see with her own eyes all the wondrous technology that could do things that defied all reason, to be part archaeologist and part treasure hunter. Ritza answered, those people get rich by selling the technology, and scientists try to replicate the technology to make everyone's life easier. Verrier, who wore a perpetual sneer, and who Ritza also thought looked a lot like a rat, asked, Does anything bad ever happen to the treasure hunters? Ritza, tired of being put on the spot, barked, What is this? Why try to scare me now? If you didn't want me to be part of your crew, shouldn't you have said something before we departed, and not after we broke orbit? Aberta told her, We want you to respect the situation. We don't want you to inadvertently kill us all. And how exactly would I do that? Verrier answered, By fiddling with things that you don't know what they do. The captain said firmly, In the ship. Then Verrier said, And on the derelicts. Don't touch anything. Rissa didn't think that sounded like much fun. Chapter 2 Ritza and her uncle Renwick were floating in Ritza's cabin, which wasn't all that big, but it was a space for some privacy, and Ritza was thankful for that. Ritza had to know more about what was really going on here, but she didn't know how to begin. She started with, Thank you for taking me with you into space. I never would have been able to if you hadn't offered. Renwick said, It's the least I could do for my sister's daughter. You remind me of her. A lot. Ritza hoped he'd be forthcoming and truthful, and she said, My dad tells me that, too. I don't know how to say this, but something seems off with Uberta and Verrier. You'll get used to them. I'm sure I will. It's just that you seem scared of the captain. Is she forcing you? Renwick silenced her with a finger to his lips. He dug around in the pouch that was attached to his belt. He pulled out a pad of paper and a mechanical pencil. He wrote something and handed it to her. It said, The Captain and Verrier are bad people. Criminals. And if I don't find them treasure, they'll hurt me. But don't worry. 
I'm always one step ahead of them. Ritsa was disgusted that he had brought her into this, and she spat, And you thought it was a good idea to also put your niece into danger? Renwick pointed urgently at the pad of paper. He wrote, Wasn't the life you were living dangerous? Wasn't your mother killed being a minor like you were until yesterday? Ritza's eyes bulged. She had never felt such betrayal. She was about to speak when Renwick squeaked, Use that! He pointed again at the paper. Ritza refused and said, I doubt your sister, my mother, would approve of this. Some uncle you've turned out to be. Renwick said back, She died when you were small. You don't know what she would have thought. Ritza felt like she had been slapped. Why had she agreed to go anywhere with someone she didn't know? The man hadn't visited her and her father for twenty years. He seemed no better than a Berta and Verrier. She said with bared teeth, Get out. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. Renwick didn't make any motion to leave her tiny cabin, and so Ritza yelled, Get out of my room! Her uncle closed his eyes, opened them, nodded, and jetted out of her cabin. Ritza realized she had wanted to ask him why he had asked her to come along in the first place, his real reason. She wasn't buying his supposed altruism. He must need her for something. But for what? Chapter 3 Ritza had gotten used to wearing next to nothing in the hot confines of the sweltering spaceship, so it felt odd to be wearing layers again, and even odder to be wearing a weapon on her hip. Why do I need this again? Verrier, who openly wore two weapons, and who Ritza saw had hidden even more, answered her. Because space stations are thief dens. You can't trust anyone in them. Every kind of criminal you can imagine lives in them. Ritza thought to herself, takes one to know one, but stated instead, I'm excited to see the station. I've never been to one before. Their pilot, Jimenez, told her, it's going to blow you away. Just you see. Ritza hadn't seen much of Jimenez, who rarely left the cockpit. Ritza liked him, as he didn't seem to have it out for her, unlike the captain and Verrier. Renwick agreed. Candle Station here is one of my favorites. She's a gem. Aberta announced to everyone, but looked only at Ritza. Here we go, people. Stay alert, and be back in two hours if you don't want to become a permanent resident. And for emphasis, she stabbed a finger on Ritza's sternum. The door opened, and Ritza found herself in a pine forest. The station hallway was much taller than inside their ship, and in comparison, Ritza felt it to be cavernous, and the temperature was cold like a fall day. She was glad for her extra layers. As they walked towards the end of the hallway, Ritza could smell the pine trees, and she enjoyed kicking through the pine needles. Wherever humans went in the solar system, they always brought plant life with them. Practically speaking, it was to save on the cost of oxygen, but Ritza didn't care about that. What she cared about was that being amongst the plant life made her soul sing. The five of them turned the corner of the hallway, and Ritza could tell that the people blocking their way meant them harm. There were ten or so of them, and they all had weapons drawn. The tallest of the ambushers shouted calmly, Now don't do anything that's going to get you hurt, or worse. Hands in the air, but not you, Jimenez. You come here. And nice work. You delivered the spaceship right on time. I'm impressed. Time seemed to slow down for Ritza. How could this be happening? They had only stopped at Candle Station for supplies and fuel. They hadn't even made it to the treasure-filled derelict that her uncle was having them travel towards. Her adventure was ending before it even began. Aberta seethed with anger. How could you? After all I've done for you! The tall ambusher admonished. I'd be upset too if I was you, but it's not like I gave Jimenez much of a choice in the matter. You see, I have his family, and if he wanted to see them again, he had to deliver me your ship. He had no choice. Ritza couldn't help but notice the irony of the situation. Aberta and Verrier had forced Renwick to do their bidding, and here the tall ambusher had forced Jimenez to dance to his tune as well. Ritza was glad Aberta and Verrier were getting theirs, but Ritza wished she hadn't gotten caught in the middle of either scheme. Jimenez was with the ambushers now. He agreed. I didn't have a choice. I'm sorry, Captain. Verrier said, You're sorry, all right. Then Ritza, Renwick, Aberta, and Verrier all had their own personal captor who held a weapon at their back. Aberta asked, And what will become of us? The man shrugged. 
Depends. Most likely a different fate for each of you. Now what do we have here? A young one, he examined Ritza. Never seen a creature like you. So thin, it's almost like you're not there. And the head, it's so tiny. I'm sure some customer will find you quite appetizing. Ritza heard her uncle mutter something, and so did their talkative captor. What was that? Why don't you repeat that so we can all hear what you're saying? Renwick said something Ritza couldn't quite make out, something like, Fibe rele cano. And Ritza thought her uncle's mind had cracked in half. But she barely had time for that thought when a million tiny balls of light began to pour out of Renwick's clothes. The lights were no bigger than moths, and they zoomed through the air suddenly everywhere. Ritza watched with horror as the lights crawled over everyone but her and Renwick. There were so many that Ritza didn't know how they all could have fit in her uncle's clothes. The lights shot into people's mouths, noses, and ears, and whatever the lights were doing inside the people, it gave them all seizures. Ritza didn't even notice when Renwick had appeared in front of her. Ritza, we've got to go to the ship. Ritza looked and saw that Captain Oberta, Verrier, and Jimenez as well weren't immune from the lights' attacks as the lights swarmed over them too. We're leaving the others here? Yes. Sooner rather than later, they were going to kill us. Ritza couldn't believe they were going to be free of a Berten Verrier. They had gotten out of a trap that she hadn't seen a way out of, but her uncle had, hadn't he? Ritza didn't like he'd gambled with her life, but in the end, he'd freed her. Maybe he wasn't as awful as she thought. Not completely, anyway. Ritza inquired, But what about Jimenez? He's no angel, trust me, but we need to leave now. We don't know how many others might be coming. We need to fly out of here before they arrive. Ritza turned and ran to the ship. Her uncle fiddled with the door controls. The doors opened, they stepped through, and the doors closed. Ritza wondered aloud, Do you know how to fly the ship? Ritza thought her uncle looked like he just saw a ghost, and he answered, I knew I was forgetting something important. You don't by chance know how to pilot a starship, do you? No, I do not. What are we going to do? Renwick smiled broadly and admitted, I'm just joking. I know how to pilot. Which Ritza didn't find humorous in the slightest. Let's get out of here. Chapter 4 Ritza and her uncle were on a moon, at the base of a mountain, standing on the snow-covered ground outside of a cave of sorts. There was a rock overhang, creating a gigantic pocket that would protect maybe 500 people from getting rained on. And in this cave, Renwick told Ritza there lived a derelict alien spaceship. Ritza took his word for it, because what she saw didn't look like a spaceship at all. She supposed the ship-sized obsidian square structure in front of them could be holding a ship inside. The longer she stood there, the more unsettled she felt. The structure didn't have any snow or ice on it, even though the cave walls were thick with it, and there was a kind of fog looming around the object. As they stepped closer, Ritza could see there was a slit in the structure. The slit was vertical, and it ran from the top all the way to the bottom. Ritza asked in an awe-filled voice, Is this the door? I believe it is. Or a way in, at least. But I really don't know. I've never been able to fit. Captain Aberta had called her skinny, and Verrier had made fun of her small head. Everyone, her whole life, had always commented about how small she was. So this is why you came to see the niece you hadn't seen in twenty years. You needed someone small to crawl into a crack for you. Renwick sighed heavily. I'm sorry I didn't visit for all those years, that I didn't see you grow up. If I could do it all over again, I would have been there. I would have been a real uncle. Ritza said, It'll be a tight fit, even for me, but I'll try. It boggles my mind to think about all the advanced technology that's in there. I just hope I can get some of it out. Think about how rich we'll be and how what you find could change people's lives. Ritza felt like she was being led in on one of life's great mysteries. She felt very fortunate indeed. Ritza sidestepped, left side first, into the slit with her face pointed over her shoulder. It was an extremely tight fit. Ritza judged there was but one inch of room surrounding her, and oh was she surrounded as she slowly shuffled forwards. She faced her legs and feet as much as she could to the left, but it was unnatural and she found she had to hop to move further in. Inside of Ritza there was a battle going on. On the one hand there was the excitement of discovery, 
but on the other was the danger that Verrier had warned her about. Ritza wished she had had the opportunity to ask Verrier more questions. The slit seemed to have come to an end, but it didn't. It was just a corner, a right-degree angle, and Ritza was able to keep going into the structure. Ritza's radio crackled to life. Ritza, I can't see you anymore. Is everything okay? Are you okay? I'm fine, but I'm glad I'm not claustrophobic. I've turned a corner. I'm in another narrow hallway. I'm guessing I'll have to go through a number of these insanely tight hallways until I get to the middle of the structure where the ship is? Renwick agreed. I think you're right, but there's only one way to find out. How are you? Are you... Ritza. And then Ritza couldn't hear her uncle anymore. Ritza guessed the structure was blocking the radio somehow. She didn't care. She didn't need Renwick to hold her hand. Ritza continued on and on. She came to another corner, made it past, and kept hop-walking. It was beginning to hurt her knees and ankles to be stuck pointing them to the left at such an extreme angle for so long. She went past seven corners, and Ritza wondered if this would ever end. What if it didn't, and she was scrunched up like this for the rest of her life? Nonsense. She'd get out, and she'd be rewarded with... Ritza didn't know with what, and that prospect kept her going. Verrier and his warning of danger were losing out to Ritza's excitement. The hallway ended, but this time there wasn't another narrow hallway. This time there was an open space, and Ritza stepped into it and reveled in being able to put her body into a different position. It felt great. In the open space, there sat a spaceship. The ship reminded Ritza of Oberta's tattoos, with it being a glowing orange color that seemed to shimmer. Ritza's heart pounded. This felt like a dream, but this was really happening to her. Then Ritza heard a voice in her head. Come inside, little one. No part of Ritza had entertained the possibility that there would be anyone alive in the ship. No treasure hunter had ever had an encounter with an alien that was still alive, so how could there be one here? A part of the ship moved. Ritza realized it was a door opening. Then she wondered how it was possible the alien could talk inside of her mind. Pushing the thought aside, Ritza stepped through the doorway. She touched the wall, and it felt like the structure that protected the ship. Again, the voice. Come forward. I mean you no harm. Ritza pushed down the desire to examine everything in the ship. She could do that later. The prospect of meeting a sentient creature from another solar system was definitely more interesting. The hallway went right, then left, and then there was an entirely unhuman-looking creature sitting in a chair. The alien looked like a large blue iguana with two legs, four arms, and a small head. Ritza rather liked that it had a small head. The alien spoke into her mind. Hello, Ritza. Lovely to meet you. I've always wondered who would come through that door, and now I know what the face of my master looks like. Ritza inquired. I'm sorry? Why would I be your master? I don't understand. And nice to meet you as well. In my culture, when one is defeated in battle, their life is forfeit. Their life is no longer theirs. Thirty years ago, my people and our enemy brought our war to your solar system. My ship was shot down here. I was defeated, and ever since, I've waited for the one who will take control of my life. Ritza blinked at that and asked, if that's how your culture works, then shouldn't your master be the one who defeated you? Or a member of the enemy you are in a war with, and not a scavenger who managed to get past your defenses? The alien said, Normally, yes. But they all left, and so the role of master fell to the first sentient being I encountered. You, Master Ritza. Ritza imagined the alien had put up the walls around his ship to delay meeting his master as long as possible. If she were bound by his culture's dictates, she too would have to put off losing her freedom as long as possible. Ritza asked, Is your ship able to travel? Could it take you home? The alien replied, My ship is functional, and it can take me home. Ritza could not believe her luck. None of the ships that had been found had a working propulsion system. If I'm your master, then I'd like you to take me to your solar system. I'd like to see your culture. I can only imagine how very homesick you must be. And after I see your home, would you take me back to my solar system? And then would you return to your home to be the master of your own life? The alien answered, You are a very generous master. 
If this is what you desire, then yes, I will obey. Ritza confided how awful she felt. I feel like I've been so rude. What is your name? It's Carthalia Genis Cruthiel Payet. If it's okay with you, I'll call you Carth for short. The alien bowed slightly in his chair. As you wish. Carth, can we leave now? Can we bring my uncle too? Master Ritza, whatever you want I will do, so yes, we can leave now, and your uncle can come with us. A part of Ritza had worried that Uncle Renwick would be disappointed in her ability to be of use to him, that she would be a burden like Verrier had voiced, but she didn't have those thoughts anymore. I can't wait to see the look on my uncle's face. Thank you for listening to today's episode. We look forward to bringing you the next episode in Glenda Blasts Your Ear Off. Oh, wait, sorry. Messed that up. My throat's gurgling. <clears> throat>